our teaching tonight, the subject is self-discipline. And you just happen to have the guru, the master of self-discipline teaching you this evening. And if you believe that, I've got some, some prime property to sell you out in Death Valley. So <laughs> I, need this, I need this study even more than you guys do, believe me. I am one who lacks self-discipline, so I took on this subject in the hopes of learning something myself that I could apply to my life. And uh, on that note, I have some good news and some bad news for you guys. Uh, the bad news, the bad news is that a few things came up this week, and uh, I didn't really feel like spending much time on tonight's message. And uh, so I didn't get it finished. Um, the good news is that I should be able to finish it in the next couple of days. So if we can all come back on Thursday, is that okay? <laughs> can you imagine if I did that to you guys? That would be like horrible. <laughs> I would just prove my comments on my own lack of self-discipline. But uh, before we start tonight's study, why don't we bow our heads? Why don't we pray and ask the Lord to give us some guidance and direction in this matter. Uh, Father, we just come before you uh, this evening, Lord, as we want to lift up this study to you. God, we ask for wisdom because we lack it. And uh, me particularly in this area, Lord, I need self-discipline and I know that I am not the only one here. So God, as we uh, dig into your word and what your word has to say on this matter, Lord, help us to understand it and help us to apply it to our own lives and not just to other people's lives. God, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, have you ever thought to yourself, you know, how much could I actually accomplish if I could just use my time effectively? How much could I accomplish if I could just focus on the task at hand without getting constantly distracted by other things? Have you ever thought how much less I would drop the ball on the things that I needed to do if I, if I, didn't, if I didn't fail to write things down and forget and pass over the things that are really important in life because I can't keep all these things in my head. And uh, if you answered yes to any of this, then we obviously share something in common tonight in addition, of course, to our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so there are men in this world like Jeff Bezos or... Elon Musk or Donald Trump, um, and I don't know why I wrote down the name Barack Obama, but he is probably a fairly self-disciplined guy. Um, not Joe Biden, though. I, I am not going to go that far. No on Joe Biden, uh, but the rest of these guys are men of self-discipline, and I must admit that I truly have pretty much almost nothing in common with that type of discipline. Um, there was a guy uh, who was the leader of Russia a hundred years ago. His name was Vladimir Lenin. And I loathe to mention his name because he was a communist. But uh, he supported and, in and introduced the redistribution of wealth in his country. But he once said this, he said, with a handful of dedicated people who will give me their lives, I will control the world. And uh, what he was basically saying here is that the world belongs to disciplined people. Uh, the world belongs to committed men. And uh, it belongs to the dedicated people who give up their life for a cause that they, were believe, that they believe in. Christianity was formed by such men in the Bible who gave up their lives for something that they 
knew was true and that they believed in. It was a cause that was worthy to lay down their lives for. And it really is true that the world does belong to disciplined people. It takes a great amount of personal discipline to produce great thinkers, to produce great writers, great musicians, great theologians, uh, great technicians, great doctors, great attorneys, great leaders. All of these take great self-discipline to achieve. But we're not here tonight to learn the self-discipline of becoming an entrepreneur. I'm not going to teach you how to do that. We're not going to learn how to become financially secure tonight. That's not the object of our self-discipline teaching tonight. And I can't teach anyone how to be a Jeff Bezos or an Elon Musk because I don't know. I don't have that in me. But our goal tonight is to learn how to be godly, disciplined men. The Apostle Paul has given us a great example in Scripture of exactly what that looks like to walk in the Spirit as a disciple of Christ. And if you haven't turned to already, we are looking at Philippians chapter 3 tonight, and I am going to start off by reading verses 12 through 14. And I'm going to take off my glasses because I just can't read with those things on. But uh, starting in verse 12, it says, Not that I have already attained or that I am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind And reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And so nowhere will you find in the verses that I just read, nowhere do you find the word self-discipline. What we read is that Paul lets go of his past and he reaches for the future. He presses towards the goal, and pressing towards the goal takes a lot of self-discipline. And so before we go any further, I kind of want to define the term for you. This is not a spiritual, biblical definition, but it is a kind of definition that you would find in the dictionary. And it says this, self-discipline is the ability to regulate your conduct by principle and sound judgment rather than by impulse, desire, high pressure, or social custom. And uh, we can turn this into a biblical definition because I could say that as a Christian, the principle that we use to regulate our conduct is the Word of God, right? And it's the Word of God that gives us the sound judgment that we need for self-discipline. And those other things at the end, the impulse, the desire, the high pressure, or the social custom, those other things come from the world. When our impulses control our conduct, then our thoughts and our actions are constantly going to be pulled in this direction and in that direction and the other direction, and everything around us is going to become a squirrel that draws our attention away from the goal. When our desires control our conduct, and I'm not talking about here the desire uh, to please God, I'm talking about the desire to please yourself. Um, When that controls your conduct, you will also not only be impulsive, but uh, you will aim to please yourself and you will not walk in the Spirit. You will walk in the flesh always at all times. And uh, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he said this, 
He said, But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should become disqualified. And so what is this control that Paul uses to keep his body under? What kind of control are we talking about? Well, it's self-control. Self-control is the last of the nine fruits of the Spirit that we read about in Galatians chapter 5. There is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. A properly disciplined life is not out of control, right? An out-of-control life is an undisciplined life. And very often, the lack of discipline and the out-of-control kind of style of living, um, it's a result of, instead of self-control, it's a selfish effort toward things like self-improvement or self-fulfillment or being geared towards success, money, material things. You know, there's nothing wrong with having things in your life as long as those things don't become the main thing. When that happens, you go from a self-disciplined life with self-control to a undisciplined, selfish life that only wants for itself. And so going back to our definition and just finishing up on those last two things high pressure and social customs those two things are very similar they're very similar when we act on something because we've been pushed in that direction or it's because it's what everyone else is doing then our heart will not be in it right and discipline is never achieved by going with the flow or by taking the path of least resistance or being pushed in a certain direction. I can show you a ton of verses that teach this very thing in God's Word. And so I'm going to pull up a couple of them that I, that I just looked through. And one of them was Exodus 23, uh, the start of verse 2. And it says, You must not follow the crowd in doing wrong. Anytime you follow the crowd, that's peer pressure or it is social custom and you are always going to end up going in the wrong direction and doing wrong things. And of course, Romans 12, 2 begins with this, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Anytime you follow the crowd, you are going to be conformed to the things of this world. We want to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and that can only happen through the self-discipline of being obedient to God's Word. Um, But getting back to our verses in Philippians, um, I love how right off the bat in these verses, Paul wants to make sure that we understand, and he says it right off the bat, that he hasn't already attained. And so he's saying he's not perfect. He's he's still working on becoming self-disciplined. And if Paul hadn't arrived after his, he was in prison at this time, after his third missionary journey, if he still hadn't arrived, then probably it's a safe bet that none of us have either, right? Um, So we're going to mark this down as our first takeaway. And I'm putting it on the screen for you. We all should be a work in progress. None of us have arrived, but we all should be working towards that goal, right? Because if we are not making progress towards a more disciplined life, if we are not a work in progress, then what we really are is just a piece of work, right? (laughs) And so the question is, how do I know whether I'm a work in progress or whether I'm just a piece of work? Well, let me ask you a question tonight. 
Have you ever felt unsatisfied with your spiritual growth? Anybody, by a raise of hands, anybody ever felt unsatisfied with their, with their current level of spiritual growth or with your present condition or your level of holiness? One thing I've noticed over the years, as long as I've been a Christian, is that the people who seem to be doing the most seem to be the least satisfied with their progress. You ever notice that? And so God will often stir up the Christian, the one who, who is, wants to do better, will stir up our condition by making us discontent with our own progress, with our own level of spirituality. And so um, this describes Paul perfectly, especially if you've ever read Romans chapter 7, which we covered quite a while ago. In verse 24, he says this. He says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And so, um, obviously, yes. Obviously, Paul was discontent with where he was at. He said, the things that I should be doing are not the things that I'm doing, but it's the things that I shouldn't do. Those are the things that I end up doing. Paul was a picture of a discontent man being stirred up by God to that discontent so that he would press forward, right? And just as he stirs up our discontent, at the same time, he stirs up our longing for something better, for something more pure, for something holy. He stirs that up in us. And so that's exactly what we see in these verses that we read. Not that I have already attained the discontent, but not that I am already perfected, still the discontent, but then the longing for something better. I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid a hold of me. Again, the discontent, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, and the longing to do better is, is he is reaching forward to those things that are ahead. He is pressing towards the goal for the upward call in Christ. And so you see it right there, the discontent with his present condition and the longing to do more, to do better. And if you're a Christian and you feel that discontent, and you have that longing, then, then you are a work in progress. Keep going. Don't, let, don't backslide. Just keep pressing forward to, toward the goal, just like Paul did. Um, I remember early on in my Christian progression or my walk, um, I read a book, and it was titled Calvary Road. I'm sure some of you have heard of this book. Some of you I've even gone through the book with. But... Uh, the first couple of chapters um, of this book, Calvary Road, uh, Roy Hessian discusses the, these words that all begin with the word self. And he mentions things like self-centeredness, self-consciousness, self-pity, self-serving. And all of these words are rooted in selfishness, and they are, in fact, sin. And I remember when I read that, and I was like, well, I've always grown up being a self-conscious person. How can that be sin? I was born that way, right? But the truth is, is these things are sin. They are sin, and if they are not sin, if they are not sin, then I can't just give it over to Jesus and ask him to cleanse me of it, right? If they're not sin, then it's something that I have to put up with for the rest of my life but they are sin. And uh, even this word self-discipline, that can be used for selfish gain because if my self-discipline is disciplining me towards just serving myself, then that is also selfish and self-discipline can be sin. So we want godly self-discipline, right? And so we want to self-discipline ourselves not for selfish gain but for our next takeaway here and that is this that you need to discipline yourself in order to serve others every christian 
believe it or not, is expected to serve one another. And Jesus said in Matthew 20, verse 28, he said this, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So you want to be more like Jesus, you want to be like Christ, then you need to serve rather than being served. That's godly self-discipline. Do you want to be more Christ-like? Then you must serve others. And we must give our lives to serve. And that is what godly self-discipline looks like. Because in God's kingdom, there is no such thing as retirement. In God's kingdom, there is no such thing as being unemployed, right? We are all in service in God's kingdom, and we are to serve one another. And Hebrews 9.14 says this, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You want to have a clean conscience? Then you can't be serving yourself. You need to be serving others with godly self-discipline. And so maybe you're thinking to yourself right now, well, Pastor Thomas... Gosh, I'm not very self-disciplined. How do I get there? And so, believe it or not, I, I looked into the subject. How do I get there? First of all, I'm not self-disciplined either. In fact, uh, I'm, as soon as I get to this first one, I'm going to explain to you what happened to me. But uh, I am a work in progress. And obviously, if you asked yourself that question, if you said to yourself, I'm not very self-disciplined, but how can I get there? Then you are also a work in progress. So kudos to you. Um, You've scored one on the first question there. (laughs) So first of all, I want to suggest to you, when it comes to self-discipline, there are steps to self-discipline. And they're very basic steps because I want to make it easy for you guys and I definitely wanted to make it easy for myself. So start small. Start, in fact, very small. And here is the first simple one. Number one, clean up your room. You ever tell your kids that? (laughs) Of course we have. If you have kids, you've probably said it. Clean up your room. And so... I decided, well, when I started preparing this message, the first thing I did was I cleaned up my office. (laughs) That was a couple weeks ago. If you go in there now, it's a mess again. (laughs) So so I, I decided, well, that was even too difficult, so I moved on to something even simpler. What did I do next? I said, well, I'm going to start small. I'm going to clean up my wallet. So I cleaned up my wallet. I took the first step, number one cleaned up my wallet. And so if for you, if cleaning your room is a little too advanced for you, then start like start small like me. Clean up your wallet or clean up your purse if that's you. I don't know. Uh, uh, that, was a, that was a mean dig right there. <laughs> so the second one, second one, be on time. How many, how many of you were late today? None of you. I know you guys were all on. No, nobody was late tonight. I know. I know when I was looking at these steps, and I and I and I went over the first one as I was cleaning up my office. Somebody walked in, and I explained to him what I was doing, and and I told him the second one on the list was be on time. And I'm like, I'm like, you know, that one I'm good at. I I'm always on time. I'm usually early wherever I go. The very next morning, I was late to the staff devotion, and, and the person I told it to looked at me and shook his head like, mm-hmm, yeah, okay. So the third one is this. Third one is take the hardest job and do it first. Well, that didn't make any sense to me. I'm like, why don't I get the easy stuff out of the way first, do those, and then move on to the hardest thing? Well, probably the hardest thing is the most important thing. I think that's probably the, 
the guy who gave me these probably had that in mind. Well, the hardest thing is probably the most important thing. You need to do that first. And then the easy stuff will just be easy. But to me, it didn't really make sense because to me, I always want to get the easy stuff out of the way and then procrastinate on the hard things till the very last minute. <clears throat> um, if I had done that, I probably wouldn't have finished this study tonight, though. So praise God that I read, take the hardest job and do that first because I actually got this finished and I'm able to teach it to you tonight. So praise God, praise God, and praise God. And the next one is this, number four. Organize and plan. Organize and plan your day, your week, your month, etc. And I'll admit, this is probably my best well, this is one of my biggest ones. I'm terrible at most of these, but this is one of the big ones. And I know some of you are bad at this as well. You know, I will, I, someone will tell me something or I'll have something in my head that I need to do. I don't write it down. I just think, oh, I'll remember it. And then the next day I'm like, what was that I was supposed to remember? No, we, we, we need to write things down. We need to plan out our days. We need to make a list. Man, that is so helpful. And uh, one of these days, I'm going to do it. <laughs> one of these days, I'm telling you. And, uh, but the truth is, is this. And this should be a takeaway, but I, was, I didn't want to mess up a takeaway right in the middle of my list here. And so I'm just going to say it. You can write it down if you want. Um, but I love the way it sounded. It says, if you don't control your life, then everything else will. And that is absolutely the truth. The last one is this. Appreciate criticism. You know, I was saying the last one was the hardest one, but I think this is probably the hardest one for me because anytime someone criticizes me, my face turns red. My ears turn red. I can feel the hair standing up on the back. I don't have a hairy back. Come on. <laughs> okay, maybe I do. Maybe I do because I can feel the hair standing up on the back of my neck. But uh, it's a hard one. I, I don't accept criticism well, but criticism is usually helpful. And so if somebody has some constructive criticism, for you instead of, um, I don't know if I can control my ears turning red, but I can definitely control my attitude toward it because I will snap. I will snap at people when they bring criticism, especially if I feel like I don't deserve that. Um, <laughs> but, but don't ignore criticism. Accept it gladly, and I think it will change your life. And so going back over all these, what do we got? We've got... Uh, Clean your room, be on time, do the hardest thing first, plan your day, week, month, etc., and appreciate criticism. And let's move on to these last two verses here. It says, verses 15 and 16, Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Let us walk in unity on this. But when I started this message tonight, and I basically I said, well, you know, hey, I didn't, I didn't finish the message tonight. Can we come back on Thursday? I was just kind of pretending, right? But when I was young, when I was young, and that includes all the way through high school, that was how I did all of my school projects, right? I never turned in anything on time. I turned them in late because I never finished on time. And, of course, the teachers, they would basically take it and mark you down a grade, right? But they weren't doing you any favors. They weren't doing me any favors. I didn't learn self-discipline in school. <clears throat> But Paul says here, as many are as mature, as many as are mature, have this mind. And so a lack of discipline is immaturity. And I pray that God has revealed this to you 
tonight. Maturity doesn't happen overnight. It takes years. And my hope is that you are a work in progress and not a piece of work. All right? It's human to be hypocritical sometimes. It's human and it is natural for us to be evil. It is human and it's natural for us to be possessive, to be self-centered, to be unkind to other people when they intrude in our space. It's human and it's natural to be lazy. It's human and natural not to care about other people. All of those things are wrong. And a Christian needs to cultivate a self-disciplined life where he is no longer doing what is human and natural, but begins to do what is right and what is good by God's standard. And so I'm going to leave you tonight with what I found to be a, a great uh, spiritual definition of self-discipline. And I found it written by John MacArthur. And he said this. He said, Self-discipline is to obey the Word of God. It is to bring my desires and my emotions and my feelings and all that's in my life under the control of God supremely so that I live an obedient life which has as its goal the glory of God. That is a self-disciplined spiritual life. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening, God, and uh, as we go into our small group time this, this, this night, Lord, I pray that uh, we would share with one another the truth that is on our hearts, Lord, that we would uh, rub off on each other in a way that iron sharpens iron, and that we would li leave here, Lord, not just, not just being discontent with ourselves, but having a hope and a longing for something better and a plan to enact that process. Lord, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.